Welcome to Let's Talk with Dr. Jeff Gardier. Today I wanted to go in the direction as to checking out how you all are doing. It was tough enough with COVID-19, the populace had to deal with that. How many of us are trying to find a new normal as we uh, go into Earth uh, 2.0? But just as we were starting to get used to it, just as we were starting to reintegrate into life, we were hit with the one-two punch, right? First it was COVID-19, but it was uh, the death of George Floyd. Uh, before that, Ahmaud uh, Arbery. Uh, before that, Breonna Taylor. Then, of course, you know, the history, right? Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, on and on and on. That's the voice of a good friend, citizen of Sway in the Morning. Uh, thought it'd be great to have him on the show today because I know the country has been going through it. People need healing, and if anything, they need to figure out ways. We all need to find ways to cope, you know, and every day is a different day. Sometimes you feel good today, and then by nighttime, you feel like you're in a funk. You wake up in the morning, you might feel like you're stuck, and then you pick it back up again, and you got to keep working to keep it level and keep it balanced. So I asked Dr. Jeff, who's been on our show um, numerous amounts of times over the years, to call to come and help folks or give folks some ideas. So I want to open up the phone lines immediately. Uh, Dr. Jeff is going to offer some free advice to you. If, you. if you're having problems coping right now, he's a psychologist. He can help out. Um, maybe your family members are. Maybe you don't even know what it is. Maybe you're fine and just want to know how to remain fine. Give us a call, 888-742-CITIZENS-3345. Dr. Jeff, welcome to the show. Give a background of applause for Dr. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brother Sway. So very good to speak with you. My love to your complete staff and, uh, of course, uh-huh. your incredible audience. And thank you for everything you've been doing on IG, on your radio show, and Sister Teresa. And so thank you so very much. All right. So we got Tracy G and Heather B um, is with us this hey, morning hey. as well. Yes. So Hey, uh, guys. How are you? All right. So hey, happy Doc. to have you. It is my pleasure. Thanks, Trace, for having us on, too. Okay. Dr. Jeff, uh, we know today is George Floyd's funeral. It literally... Um, uh, a lot of people are going to be tuned in as well because it's going to be a live stream um, as well at 11, their local time. Uh, the Fountain of Praise Church is where it's taking place. It's limited um, because of only 500 people will be able to be there. Uh, the, it'll be live streamed. A uh, spokesperson for the Fort Bend Memorial Planning Center said this uh, and released a statement. Um, you know, in your work, uh, a lot of people that are, asking for healing or asking for remedies or searching for answers, uh, especially during times like these. But I always wonder about the people who are servicing the people. What is it that they do uh, to make it through? In other words, Dr. Jeff, I mean, this has to be impacting you as well. If you got a chance, I'm sure you watched the footage of George Floyd's death and you watched uh, everything and the tragedy of Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Breonna Taylor. What what methods do you use of coping? How have you been through this? Well, I immediately started thinking about this way when we had gotten uh, the email from Kelly yesterday uh, asking us to please, you know, try to check in and see what is going on. Um, and I thought, you know what? Here we are helping everybody all the time. But yet, who helps the people who are on the front line? Who helps the people who deal with this every day? And Brother Sway, that includes you, too, because you are on the front lines reporting this kind of information. And what we need to understand is that all of us are in this together. We can't have a hands-off approach that just because we are helping people through broadcasting, through reporting, through therapy, that we are not affected. So what we um, tell people to do, we have to follow ourselves. That means taking good care of ourselves physically, making sure that we have some sort of movement in our lives with regard to physical exercise, that we are part of the movement with regard to demanding and being involved in social change uh, by meditating, by prayer, all of the things that we need to marshal in our forces right now um, to take care of ourselves, because a lot of us are not okay. And as I talked to a group, uh, a news group uh, during the week, we said it's okay not to be okay. 
but it's not okay to stay not okay. We have we can we can play uh, and be part of the sick role. Sometimes we need that in order to heal, but we also have to be able to take the responsibility of moving forward. And I think that's what we really need right now is to process what's going on, but we need to move forward in society, but also in our own personal lives. How do you like how do you suggest? I mean, it feels like that's not something you could just say, OK, I'm going to move forward today and then everything, leave everything behind. Like are there mm-hmm. methods you can take or there exercises you could implement in your daily routine to help level you out? Yes, absolutely. And I think that is the key. The daily routine. What is your daily routine? You know, a lot of people sway um, when we got the orders to, you know, shelter in place and stay at home. A lot of people felt that we were cut off from the rest of the world and this was a time to just stay still. And that works for just a little while, but it's also an opportunity to be able to make some major changes in our lives. Uh, I know for me as a provider, this gave me the, the, the opportunity to actually be able to do some soul searching, to be able to come up with a list of five things, for example, that I've always wanted to do, but I never took the time or convinced myself that I didn't have the time. One of those things uh, was playing musical instruments, guitar and piano that I always wanted to do. The other thing was to start practicing and studying voiceovers. So, you know, and, and the list goes on and on. The other thing was to get to know my children who had become strangers to me in my own home because I was working all the time. Another thing was to work on my marriage and make it stronger because now that we had to shelter in place, if there was a better time to talk and to listen and to understand this was it. So I think really for all of us, this is about not just how do we suffer through this, but how do we get better? And that's why I really do believe that with all of these police killings on Earth 1.0, it would have been same-o, same-o. On Earth 2.0, with this coronavirus really just ripping off the scab Uh, off of every social inequity, now we understand people have the empathy, people feel the pain, people really do see with the naked eye what's going on. And all those people who died on the front lines for COVID-19, all of the uh, underrepresented minorities and black people and brown people who were more at risk to COVID-19 because of all of the social inequities and an unequal medical uh, institution that is out there and all of the things we see that have kept us down for so long. Um, all of those things, now um, it would be in vain if we let them happen and not make earth-shattering change. We had earth-shattering events, uh, especially COVID-19. Now we need the change to go along with it. You know, um, and I'll let Heather and uh, Tracy jump in. These events psychologically are impacting black folks differently than any other folks. In this country, I'm not taking away from anybody's pain, but to see the cyclical effect of this kind of uh, racism, um, these heinous crimes, these murders, you know, a lot of us uh, grew up seeing this around the world. I mean, around our lifetime, my mother just said there's nothing new that's happening right now. It was always there. Does this pass on through genetics as well, this kind of trauma where when we keep seeing people who look like us uh, killed by the hands of the law and nothing's changing, how are we being impacted differently than, let's say, my Caucasian counterpart? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that's a sway question because um, it is highly complex and makes really um, uh, almost unearthly sense. When we're looking at issues of genetics, one of the things that has been theorized, and I'm not a geneticist, let me put that out there right now before Mm -hmm. the haters get involved, okay? I'm not a geneticist. 
But one of the <laughs> things that we have learned is if there is a behavior that becomes ingrained, ingrained or a perception that becomes ingrained and we see it over and over and over and we begin to absorb that, that it can actually be passed down uh, through the generations. So that's the theory and one that, you know, I actually believe in. But the other part of that is, when you are an individual who is in fight or flight your whole life, and by fight or flight, what I mean is that, you know, you're in hyper arousal. You're always wondering what's going on. You have a healthy paranoia. You're always wondering why you're being treated a different way. That puts you in fight or flight mode because it's about danger. There's constant danger, breathing while black, living while black, walking while black, being in the park while black. Um, after a while, all of that um, uh, adrenaline and the neurotransmitters and the endorphins begin to break down your physical system. And so basically, when I say that racism is killing us, racism psychologically and physically is making our health worse than what it is. And that's why we see it's not just the genetics of something like hypertension that we seem to have, heart issues that we seem to have, but it's the actual pressure of racism all the time. So when you look at the genetics of behaviors and perceptions that have been handed down or brought down generation after generation, and then you looked at, at the collective unconscious, which is part of that. And then you look at uh, these dangers that we face every single day, not just physically, not just psychologically, but even legally. Then we ask ourselves, how did we make it even this far? But this is why there must be a change. And why with COVID-19, we now see a more diversified group. We see people from all uh, of the different um, uh, races and, and you know, people from different religions and everyone as much as possible being able to come to the fore and support social change because now everyone knows what it feels like to have that proverbial um, knee on their neck, and that was called COVID-19. It's called the recession that we're in. It's called you know, being in a political system that is so partisan that people don't know from one day to the next what will happen in our society. Dr. Jeff is here. I'm going to open up these phone lines, citizens. If you're looking for ways to go cope or you just want to just have a conversation with him, he's a psychologist. He's helped a lot of folks. You may have seen him on TV. Um, I, I know him as a friend as well. Um, 888-742, absolutely, 888-742-3345. Speak with Dr. Jeff. Get some free advice. Uh, Sway in the morning, Shade 4-5. Sway in the morning, Shade 4-5. We have psychologists. Uh, Dr. Jeff is here. Dr. Jeff, can you give out your social? Because if people want to hit you beyond the show, and maybe they want to uh, start working with you, how can they reach you? Sure. You can reach me uh, on Twitter, at Dr. Jeff. Gardier, D-R-J-E-F-F-G-A-R-D-E-R-E, -E -E, or you can just uh, email me, uh, Dr. Jeff Gardier uh, at Gmail, which is D-R-J-E-F-F-G-A-R-D-E-R-E -E 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 at Gmail. We have Sahur from Minnesota on the line. How are you? Hey there. Good. How are you guys? Doing great. How are you in Minnesota right now? How are you hanging? I'm good. I actually live about an hour away from the Twin Cities, so it's not the same as people who are down, down in the cities. Okay, okay. So you want to uh, comment? Yeah. Um, so hearing um, the doctor talk about um, the long-term effects of racism in the U.S., I remember because I studied public health, and one of my epidemiology classes, I, we talked about um, the maternal health um, with African-American women, and comparing that to women like myself who were born in Africa and immigrated um, later on in life, and how, you know, the women who have immigrated have the same maternal um, health and length, same as white women, because um, compared to the African-American women who grew up here who have, race, uh, who have faced racism from birth up until, you know, they're, given, um, they're pregnant themselves, and then that puts them at a higher risk. For that reason so when he mentioned that that brought me back to thinking about um, what I've studied and how that relates to 
the long-term effect of racism and how that affects women who are um, the African American um, women die um, in childbirth more than white women and African women. But myself, who has kids now, my kids are at the same risk as an African American woman because my kids were born here, and they're also facing the same racism from birth compared to myself, who hasn't faced anything until I moved to the U.S. when I was nine. Hmm. See, that, that's what we were just talking about, right, Doc, uh, Doctor Jeff? Exactly. Is that exactly. e- Epi? Exactly. We talked. To- and we talked about this earlier um, last week. I want to say it's epigenetics um, studies that that proven what she is saying. So who is saying as well? We've got to look into it. But that's what you're saying, Doctor Jeff, right? Exactly. And it is. Uh, we do know. Uh, and again, the study showing she gave us a very good epidemiological uh, mm-hmm. example that the continued racism, the environmental racism, um, and, and going beyond genetics, but the continued environmental racism um, is, is causing uh, our children to have many more stressors, and with those stressors, it puts them at risk for illness. And then going back very quickly, Sway, to the excellent point you made about genetics. So what happens? Then we keep giving birth to more and more children in a society where race uh, and racism plays a major factor. So when those people are uh, psychologically compromised and may have more anxiety and have more depression, then guess what? Those are the people who end up now having more children and they are born with that uh, uh, depression or or genetic predisposition to that uh, depression or anxiety. So we see genetically where this may actually play a real role. Hmm. So here, thank you for your call. We really appreciate your perspective and you're a citizen. That's way in the morning. Thank you. Okay. Take care of those beautiful babies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Brent in Utah. Good morning. How you doing? What's up, Brent? Hey, Brent. Good, man. Good, man. Thanks for taking my call. Appreciate it. Absolutely, man. You want to make a comment? Yeah. So I have a, uh, I have a two and a half year old daughter and we just had a, uh, we just had a son a couple months ago. And, uh, you know, lately I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, with everything going on with COVID and the economy and, and all those idiots we have in the white house. It's like, I'm struggling with, did I do my kids? a disservice in, in bringing them into the world at a, at a time like this. You know, I can't shake the feeling that things are going to be hard economically. You know, things are going to be hard politically. It's just a different time. And, and I'm just really struggling with the fact that, you know, did I, I don't want to say, did I make a mistake, but rather mm. did I, did I do a disservice to them by, by bringing them in into a world at a time like this? Mm. Uh, this, this brother Brent is uh, certainly uh soul searching here. And and I would say this, look, all is in divine order. Uh, Your children are here. Your children are called the indigo children uh, because they were brought here to help us heal this planet, to fight for um, uh, social justice, to make a real change on this world. Uh, they, they, They just weren't born just to inhabit some space on this planet. I really do believe that our children are going to grow up in an environment uh, where they will see that there is some light at the end of the tunnel and that each and every one of us now must be involved in the struggle, in protest, in demonstrations, in education, in being part of the police department, in becoming lawyers, in becoming broadcasters, in becoming all of those things that can promote equality. So certainly I am happy that you brought your children uh, onto this planet, and God blesses all children anywho. So he shouldn't feel guilt then. How how does he cope with that, though? Are there... Are there, are there exercises or things he can do to rid himself of that guilt? Well, I, I think certainly um, it, it's absolutely fine for him to feel that guilt uh, because okay. it's normal to feel that kind of guilt now. But, okay. however, that guilt is not going to benefit his children as they get older uh, because they'll start seeing it as, ooh, was it a mistake that I came here? I know my, my, my parents love me, but was it a mistake? I would say the, the actual, and thank you, Sway, so much for, for keeping us uh, very focused as to giving concrete advice that works. 
Yeah. We don't need just pundits just uh, waxing poetic. It's important that we give concrete examples. And the concrete example I would give is starting from now with your children, begin thinking about the life that you think they should have. They, they will determine on their own, but begin pointing them in a, a direction where each and every day they are learning something new. Uh, make sure that they get the best education. Make sure that you're teaching them at all times. Make sure that you're leading by example so that they can help bring a difference. And that's what we want for all of our children. Uh, Sway, I know you want that for your, for, for your beautiful little daughter. That's why you yeah. have her on the IGs, because one day she's going to take over the IGs and take over the throne and will be the one that will be, uh, you know, running the show. Mm -hmm. And so when we have those sorts of thoughts and aspirations for our children and we keep their nose to the grindstone with regard to excellence, 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 then those are the very concrete things we can, we can do. And let me say this very quickly, Brother Sway. I yes. remember when I was a kid, I would ask my father all the time, my father, I would say, and this we're talking about back in the early 60s, I would say to my father, well, how come I have to, why do you make me go to school earlier? How come mm -hmm. I have to stay at school later? How come you want me to do all of my homework as soon as I come home? How come you want me to read all these extra books? And his response was, and you know what the response was, was because back, back at the time we were using the term Negro. That's how mm -hmm. old I am. He said, because you are a Negro and you are always going to have to work 10 times harder. So I'm training you now. Mm. Br uh, Brent, man, I appreciate your call. And as a father, I, can, I definitely can relate to what you're saying. And Dr. Jeff is a father um, as well, man. And, you know, give them the best life you can give them with the best energy you could give them. OK. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You're a citizen, Brent. Thank you. Let's wait in the morning. Hey, Dr. Jeff, this is Tracy. Thank you again for being a part of this conversation. Uh, I had two questions. You kind of answered the first one I had with um, how you presented some um, feedback to Brent. It was about white guilt. If we should look at that through a psychological lens, I know a lot of the black community tends to just dismiss it. And I wonder for some white people who may realize, wow, I grew up in a home that really poured these racist mentalities into me. My, it might be a shock, you know? And so mm -hmm. if you do have something different from Brent, just to look at it from a psychological lens. And then my second question is, there are a lot of white folks who are realizing how they have been implicit in racial injustice and are coming to their black coworkers or black friends and saying, listen, I wanna have a conversation about this. But that black friend or coworker may feel uncomfortable even though it's a needed conversation. So just some tips on navigating discourse in that sure. way. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, I would say, Tracy, to your very first question about white guilt, um, no one is going to really feel that guilt unless they actually uh, understand that whether on a conscious level or unconscious level, due to racism and institutional bias, uh, that they have been part of that. It's not necessarily that they woke up one day uh, or wake up every day and figure out how can I keep my knee on the neck of a, uh, of a black man or, or black people. It's the system has been set up uh, in mm -hmm. order to have a ruling class uh, and a class that is ruled. That, that's, that's the way it has been. Uh, so when we try to get some people to feel that white guilt, uh, I see all that we're doing is playing into the hands of partisan politics, where now certain people are saying, OK, well, you, you want to defund the police, so, so we're going to run on law and order. So we need to be really careful about that. And so it's not about getting them to feel the guilt. And I know that's not what you're saying, uh, but I'm saying uh, for them to feel that guilt, uh, they have to really understand that they are part of a system, either consciously or unconsciously, uh, that has perpetuated that. It may not necessarily be their fault, but it's part of that system. But, and then that brings us to white privilege, this whole idea that now we have a lot of um, 
uh, white people who are saying, I understand now that I have white privilege. With the killing of George Floyd, I understand it. Now I see it. Now that I've been humbled by COVID-19, I understand it. And I know it's been very difficult for us as black people to have to step up yet again to educate white people as to, you know, what it is that white privilege brings them and how we have been held down from it. But you know what? That is our plight right now. If we have white friends, coworkers, family members, whatever the case may be, who want to acknowledge their white privilege and even more want to do something about it in order to help bring about social change, then I say educate them, talk to them, but also take the time to breathe yourself. Take the time to be able to carefully think about what you want to tell them, but most Mm -hmm. importantly, what you want to teach them, because I'm telling you, we need every ally we can get. And to make significant social change, we can't do this alone as black people. We can lead, but we need the full support of our society to make significant change. Mm-hmm. Okay, Dr. Jeff. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Jeff, uh, for co- chiming in with us today. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a at one point I was saying it's an eerie time, but also it's a time for change, time for action, and people aren't settling for nothing less. But we also, to your point, have to take care of ourselves in this process, you know, mind, body, and spirit. And you gave some great information today. I want to thank you, tell you salute for the work you've been doing. I've been watching what you're doing online as well. And your life is dedicated to service and helping people live better lives. So, Dr. Jeff, if people want to reach you one more time, give out your information excuse me, information, because there's a lot of people on the lines, DJ Shark in Charlotte, Todd in Florida, DeFonte in Chicago, and others. How can they reach you directly? Sure. Again, uh, Twitter, at Dr. Jeff Gardier, or even better, uh, Dr. Jeff Gardier, D-R-J-E-F-S-G-A-R-D-E-R-E, um, at Gmail. Okay. Get that advice from him. If you mention Sway in the morning, he's going to give it to you for free initially. All right. <laughs> absolutely, no, listen, absolutely free. No worries, I, Brother Sway, because you know what? You have had great success and you have been compensated in the way that you should. But there's so much the public doesn't know that you've dedicated with regard to your life that no money could ever pay for what you've done for us as far as being a leader um, uh, with regard to opening up. Uh, our world to diversity, but most importantly, for pride uh, for all black people, all brown people, and all people who are friends of our community. Thank you, Dr. Mm. Jeff. I appreciate you, and I appreciate those words, man. Thank you very kindly. I'll reach out to you soon, okay? All right, brother. You got it. Take care, ladies. Goodbye, everyone. God bless. Take care, awesome man. To you. We got Celebrity Wire up next. Yeah, and Drake's producer, 40, he has some words about when Pusha T dissed him. Shade 4-5.